I think there's a deep cultural assumption of punitive punishment and of othering. You know, like there are people who dissolve dignity and humanity and people who don't. Um, and when I was in grad school, I had the opportunity to go to Zimbabwe where there had been um, and was working with actually a mission, a Catholic mission, up in Matabela land where there had been a series um, of massacres throughout the 1980s in which like thousands, tens of thousands of people were killed, were put in mass graves, and people were living next to their neighbors who had killed their husband 10 years ago and were, like, were living with that violence and that insult every single day. Um, and then there was some political upheaval and folks who had the opportunity sought their revenge and their vengeance. Um, and like, and after literally um, decades of being politically solved, of being um, a, a, a kind of destruction, um, and went to Zimbabwe as they were rebuilding. So there had been kind of this political collapse. There had been like some attribution killings. Um, but it was a community on both sides that was devastated, that had seen more violence than I had ever known or experienced in my life, and were figuring out ways to repel the community that wasn't actually based in punishment or retribution. They had kind of, kind of gone through that, seen the effects, and were having a huge economic um, issues because of a dam and huge like drought issues. And so people were starving and they were hungry and the government was falling apart and the currency meant nothing and people's wealth and stability were at question. So these fault lines that were based in deep, deep personal violence and trauma were being bridged and people were trying to figure out how to live together and forgive each other. And if not forgive each other, at least survive together. Um, and I was incredibly moved and like, in, and I, like it was revel it was revelatory to me of the, like the, the solution and like I think that like you know like I grew up in a church and so like, like and not a church that believes in the iPhone and I but the idea like how do all ethics play out in our politics and like what is the level of violence and trauma that we can sustain and still think about a more productive way of being together in the world. And so my time in Zimbabwe was just incredibly um, revelatory and instructive in terms of the reality that the way in which I have been taught we must deal with social infractions, with, like, with, you know, with violence, with trauma, was actually not true. And in this community had actually led to economic um, and like, like desperate, desperate conditions. And that, like, the ability to come together to hold people accountable, but also to walk towards kind of a shared vision of what was necessary to survive was actually kind of giving folks strength and also allowing folks and like that also included doing like you know taking bodies out of mass graves and reburying them like it wasn't a process of forgetting or silencing it was a process of like literally like reburying like you know like um, bringing bones that had been buried 20 years before back to the surface and having like real conversations and real trauma and real pain and tears around what had happened in this community and only then was there a way to move forward but folks were trying to move forward um, and so I think it was my first introduction to a different kind of like cultural value system and a different kind of idea of what it could be, like what accountability means, what violence actually rots, um, and how do we actually move forward collectively um, when our survival depends on it. Um, and so that was an experience that was incredibly powerful for me. I think the other experiences was just a series of loved ones um, and people in the community that I was in community with being locked up and having this sense of the, the, like, the conditions of this are impossible. Like this is this is inhumane. Um, this like this is destroying us. Um, and that there are too many people who have too much profit to be made off of our destruction to allow these systems to continue. Um, so I mean, I think all that to say that I think abolition has been a political process for me, and was lastly assisted by the last three years and just the organizers who I get to work with, and th this clear sense of folks who were in communities, were in North Minneapolis where like violence was an issue, some of whom were being like, like themselves um, like sexually harassed or assaulted and understanding that like police and these systems don't keep them safe at all. Um, and so understanding the deep failures of the system and then on the other side, what it did to folks who were put through it. Um, so all that to say, yes, um, abolition is and should be on the table. And I think I feel incredibly hopeful about the idea of abolition. Um, number one, because I'm hearing from communities who have had different Ta like tactics of dealing with violence and trauma for a long time, understanding this is now more legitimate than the police state that we're inside of. So I think that's a really important like like shift that at least I have seen and been noticing that and th that moved me personally as well. That I feel really hopeful about. Um, I also feel hopeful about the ways in which people are linking the funding of these systems and like just like how like how the roots spread all the way out. That like I mean I think the prison strikes that are happening across the country in the Free Alabama movement, the way that we're talking about how if we like 
like the way that prison label still feeds economies, the way that like like you know the building of prisons, the employment of correctional officers in prisons, that all of these things are so embedded in our economy. And a real, I think, analysis and assessment of how wide the net of the PIC is, although daunting and depressing, I think is really helpful because it gives us a sense of the system. I think that before that we before we can untangle. Um, or dismantle, we have to have a sense of the full scope. And that work is happening, which makes me hopeful and I think is really important. And then folks are building other ways of being together in really powerful ways right now that I think we've had, um, I keep on saying this, but an emperor has no clothes on moment for lots of our people and for other people. And so there's this realization of like these systems are corrupt, they're illegitimate, they're violent, and they're not effective. Um, and so I think that... Um, that because of that, the work that folks have already done for decades or centuries or generations of building other ways to deal with trauma, of building community-based alternatives, is there's a resurgence of it. And I think that that is 100% necessary. That, like, we cannot, whatever we do to this system, if we can stop it, if we can fully totally dismantle it, if there's, you know, a violent revolution, whatever happens, if we don't have in place some other ways of dealing and other ways of both governing but also of dealing with trauma, um, that that we won't succeed, that there will be a disaster capitalism kind of moment and there will be a new form um, of what we've already seen. Um, so yes, I think it should. I think it can. Um, I think that it's difficult. I think that for the first time folks saw, it was at um, a law school event um, at NYU and it was a conversation about abolition. And it was, it was interesting because I realized when, when I went that I had never in law school or undergrad had a, like a serious conversation about abolition in an academic setting. That it's just like people didn't talk about abolition as a thing. It was like, I mean, it was a thing, but it wasn't like a, like a corner of political thought that we could actually engage it in the classrooms that I was in um, and that informed my thinking. And that, that happened over drinks and other, in other places, um, but didn't happen in the classroom. And so I was like, I think there's an institutional shift that is already happening that has to happen in terms of how different... Um, institutions understand their role in society and understand the scope of the criminal, of the criminal legal system specifically. Um, I think there's a cultural shift in all communities that has to happen around what we think makes us safe. And I think, I mean, like I've been moved by the organization that's happening about kind of asking folks what makes them safe and then trying to figure out ways, like how do we support mental health stuff? How do we make sure folks have stable housing, which is a huge indicator of, of safeness? Like how do we think about the long-term solutions um, and the long-term investments that actually make us safe. But that doesn't, I think, interrupt the fact that people are still calling the police when there's a mental health emergency, even though we know the police kill us in mental health emergencies. That, that folks don't feel like they have a choice. Um, and so we have to build out those choices in a real way and make them available. Um, so I think there's a cultural element. I think there's a policy element. Like, I'm, the idea of starving the system more inside of, that we must at every single turn um, oppose any additional funding, any legitimization of funding for any of the systems, um, and not just police, but also the prison industrial complex, also surveillance technologies, also courts. Like we have to insist upon, I think, the 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 starving and defunding of those systems, and then be very clear about where we want that money to go, which is a different fight. Um, I also feel in this moment, I think surveillance is quickly becoming. Um, the kind of the go-to um, for both the corporate profit and the government control that our system actually is like in service of and that was developed in service of. Um, and so I'm worried about an analysis that, and I think the PIC analysis does do this, but I'm worried about um, in political education with our people and in our own vision and aims, um, that if we accommodate this surveillance state, that is actually the next PIC that we will see, that we will see the ways in which... Um, technology and surveillance become cages in very literal ways and restrict our freedoms and, and deny us our dignity. So I think like thinking about that, like just the ways that, that, you know, that these systems transform themselves is like for me one of the biggest threats. So they, like, I can see a time when <clears throat> the prison industrial complex doesn't involve that many prisons, um, but nonetheless has the same incredibly dangerous and destructive impact that it has now. Um, so yeah, I think it should. I think it can. I think it's a lot. I think that we have to be imagining something different constantly and be having these conversations constantly. And I think both institutionally and in our communities, um, be having them. And I mean, those, I think it's the Andrew Davis quote of, you know, why don't we ever talk about the idea of prisons being off the table? That like for so long has been like 
just not a possibility that folks and like we don't speak things into possibility they won't be possible so I think just all of us take it into whatever space and there's been a really interesting like thinking about the ecosystem we have folks who are really sympathetic to movement in Powell in really different places you know nationally we have them in Powell more and more um, we're seeing like the rise I think of black female leadership um, <clears throat> and queer leadership across the board we're seeing like folks being forced in like philosophic places and government places and institutions that have traditionally not touched race um, in a real way do it and like having to talk about it and so I think they should also be talking about abolition and we should be really clear that part of what we want to be discussing um, is the abolition of these current systems in this state um, so I think that it requires upon each of us kind of like that we have to take that into whatever spaces we're in and we're in a lot of different spaces now but just being clear on like that is a political hard line for us is that we want to see the abolition of these these systems and that we understand that I think the movie 13 and just like that awareness we understand that as a continuation of the abolition fight against slavery that this is a continuation of that that war and that fight